Oh, yeah, that's a smart way to get it over there, huh? As a PDF. There you go. Then you guys know how to use this stuff. Good. All right. Well, please turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 24. This will be Lesson 28, David Numbers Israel. We saw at the end of our last lesson how uh, David and even some of his bravest men had once again wiped out some of the Philistines, the giants, some of the relatives, the family members of Goliath that David had at one time killed. And uh, peace had to be made with the Gibeonites because of uh, Saul's sin. So, I guess that's just a good thing to remember even on you know, a big election day. They want to be president. They want to be governor. Or they want to be a state representative. Those are all good things. But then the question is, will they give the honor and the glory to God as they should? Will they honor and obey His commandments? Because now... God is going to hold them in an even higher regard. Right now, in my location, in my place here on this earth, I, I, I can't make a law or change a law here in the state of Wisconsin. I mean, I can send a letter to my congressman. But if I was the governor, now I can. And so God is, would hold me in higher regard than any of you, because you can't change a law, but I would have that power. And God would hold me in high regard and say, you have an even greater responsibility now because you can make so many changes and the laws that you approve or sign had better obey and abide by my scriptures. Anyways, but now we'll see how David uh, falls and fails into, into sin because of his own, uh, well, because of his heart. It's really his heart. All right, verse 1. And again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. For the king said to Joab, the captain of the host, which was with him, Go now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, and number ye the people, that I may know the number of the people. And Joab said unto the king, now the Lord thy God add unto the people how many soever they be, an hundredfold, and that the eyes of my Lord the king may see it. But why doth my Lord the king delight in this thing? Notwithstanding the king's word prevailed against Joab and all the captains of the host. And Joab and the captains of the host went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. Now, We've seen numberings go on before. But the difference is, and we'll see in this lesson, how it was sin. Because again, it has to do with the heart. Now, let us understand something here at the beginning. When I fall into sin, when I do sin in my life, I can't say God made me do it. That's a temptation, and that is a hard understanding for us to understand sometimes. Because we understand and know that God is in control of all things. So we might say, well, if God is in control of all things, why does he keep allowing me to sin? Why do I keep falling into sin? The Lord gives us the ability because he sent his son, because he loved us, our sins are now forgiven. And it makes it now possible for me to see my sins, to know how great they are, and to turn from them. And I do not. It's my own sin. I can't blame it on God. So that's why we have to be careful, because some might point to this verse in here and say, well, see, God, God made David sin, because the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, go number now, the nice thing, the beautiful thing about this text is, if you keep your finger here, please, and turn in your Bibles to First Chronicles 21, so maybe you still have that other page in there, but it's probably not just right there, but First Chronicles 21, verse 1, it says something different. 
And it helps us to understand what we're reading here in 2 Samuel chapter 24. First Chronicles 21 verse 1 says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. We don't know what the sins of Israel were, that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. They were probably, maybe some of them were worshipping idols. There were probably rebellions still against David. Now that some of these things, you know, the wars were kind of getting wrapped up and over, maybe the people were living too comfortable of a life and they weren't going to the Lord in prayer like they should, or they weren't going to the tabernacle to offer sacrifices like they should. We don't know. The Bible is us. But anyways, the Lord is angry. And again, one Bible text says the Lord did it. The second text says the Satan did it. Well, we have to understand this thing. God always works out his counsel, so what God wants to happen, we know will happen. Okay, But God uses Satan here. He allows Satan, just like Satan went to Job and, and bothered Job and did some things. Satan is given the ability... Satan has the power. God can restrain Satan's power. Satan, if I couldn't handle, if I mentally or physically could not handle maybe the death of a child, God would not allow Satan to do that to me. He would not. He restrains Satan in that sense. But here, he looses Satan. He says, Satan, you have the ability and the power to do this. And so David is tempted by Satan. Satan works in his heart. And he wants to number the people. Now, again, there was nothing wrong in the past of doing this, but David's motives are wrong. He's seen the growing numbers of the Israelites. and Let's find out what they are. Let's show how mighty and great they are so we can broadcast our numbers everywhere. Maybe he wanted to know how big his army was. Oh, look at it. I've got 800,000 men and the king of Syria only has 500,000. I bet he won't dare to fight against me now. Or, wow, look at me. I'm king over all of these people. Those are some good examples for us because we do the same thing, right? We always think about me, me, me. I, I, I. How does this benefit me? Or, Maybe I want to try to get fame from other people. Other people, oh, hey, maybe if I, if I go help out and I do this for these people, they'll all praise me. Oh, Kenton, you're the greatest. You're the nicest. Oh, Brody, I can't believe you helped out in that way. While well, everybody look at Brody. Everybody look at him, how great of a helper he is. When we do those things for the praise of men or the pride of men, that's what David was doing here. His heart was in the wrong place. We have to be careful about that. Okay. Joab protested. Joab said, David, this is not good. Don't do this. But David ignored it. He didn't care. He was the king. Who is this man, Joab, anyways? He killed all these people. He's, if he thinks he's so perfect, why is not he stop doing that kind of stuff? Well, David's being filled with pride there. He, too, is a sinner. All right, let's see what happens in the numbering then. Verse 5. And they passed over Jordan and pitched an aurora on the right side of the city that lieth in the midst of the river of Gad toward, toward Jazer. Then they came to Gilead and to the land of Tatimhadshi, and they came to Dejanan, to Jan, and about to Zinon. And they came to the stronghold of Tyre and to all the cities of the Hivites and of the Canaanites, and they went out to the south of Judah, even to Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days, and Joab gave up the sum of the number of the people unto the king. And there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men that drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000 men. So Joab, he has to obey the king. And Joab goes out, and he goes from place to place to place, Probably travels around on the map. He was gone for nine months and 20 days, almost a full year numbering the people. Now, Levi obviously wasn't counted. There was no need to because men of war would not be in Levi. 
we also understand here to it me it means that Joab he gave up the sum he was tired of it he didn't complete this but we do know that the number of men of Israel was 800 men from Israel and 500,000 men from Judah okay now there's differences in chronicles too we don't know exactly what are the differences in the numbers we don't know but the 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 fact of the matter is, they were a large, numerous people in this land. God had greatly blessed their growth, and God was also blessing them. So, it's done. The deed is done. Now what? Now, David is going to have to learn that he should have listened to Joab. He should not have been tempted by, or given in to the temptation of the devil. Verse 10, And David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly. I have sinned greatly, and that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David, and told him, and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in the land? Or, wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or, that there be three days pestilence in the land? Now advise, and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. Meaning God. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. Let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people of, from Dan even to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of Aruna the Jebusite. And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. I'll stop there. So the census is done. You ever have that? When you really want to do something, you know it's wrong, it's wicked, so you go do it, and immediately upon doing it, and you're done with it, and you've accomplished it, you feel guilt. I wished I wouldn't have done that. Maybe you're angry at a brother or sister at home, and so you're in your room or you're on the couch, and you're steaming, and you're... you're in your mind, you're thinking, what can I do to get them back? And then you go, and you do something mean to them, and it injures them, and immediately you feel guilty. I shouldn't have done that. Why did I do that? I know I'm not supposed to do that. That's the reaction David has here. His deed bothered his heart immediately. And although he confessed his sin, and although he told the Lord, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done it, and although the Lord forgave David for his sin, he still needed to be punished. And so did the people of Israel. Remember, it was the sin of Israel that made it so that the Lord allowed Satan to tempt David to do this in the first place. So they must suffer too. We kind of read at the end, David saying to God, God, don't let the people suffer because of my sake. See all these sheep? The sheep meaning the flock of God's people. See them all? Don't let them suffer for my sake, but... What David didn't see is that in all of this, God's hand was working because of the sins of the people. They, too, needed to be punished. So that's important for us. Don't just think that, well, I guess I have that at home now with Eric. You know, he's, he's two and he, he knows when he's done something wrong and he knows when he's going to get a spanking. And so what does he do now to try to get out of oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's great that you're sorry but you still need to be punished. You still need to learn a lesson. So hopefully you guys understand that in your lives, at your age, with your parents too. When you do something wrong, 
I'm glad that you're sorry for it. I'm glad that you confessed it. I'm glad you tried to make things right. But the fact of the matter remains, in many instances, your parents are going to still say, you've lost these privileges, or here's your punishment. That's what happens here. So, David sent, or God sends Gad, gives you three choices. Do you want seven years of famine? That's option number one. All right? Or, do you want three months of fleeing before your enemies? Or do you want three days of pestilence? They're all different. Seven years of famine is a long time. It's a long amount of suffering. Now, and the people die a little bit more slowly. So in the end, the same number of people may die, but it's a slower, more torturous, long-lasting death. If you go with option number two, three months of fleeing before your enemies, again, it's a little bit shorter than the seven years, but people are going to probably die more quickly than they would in the famine because they're being killed. Or the option number three, the three days of pestilence, of illness, sickness, well, we know the medicine back then wasn't the what we have it today. So if somebody got sick with a, with a pretty bad sickness, they were going to die. So they would die very quickly. So in the end, it might be the same number. We don't know. We don't know God's mind here. But in the end, we might say maybe the same amount of people die. One is seven years and one. But there's also something else that David notices here, and that is what guides his selection. He says, options one and two are out of the hands of God. If, then we're up, I mean, God is in control of everything, but in a sense... It's going to be man that's chasing us and punishing us. I'm going to choose the three days of pestilence because that punishment comes from the Lord and I know the Lord is merciful. Our Heavenly Father cares for us and He hates to chastise us too. Just like your parents, they've got to chastise you. Sometimes they, they really don't want to do it, but they know for your sake, for the sake of your soul and for your well-being in the long run, they need to punish you. God notices that too. But because of that, David also knows God is merciful. And maybe, just maybe, maybe you've had that in your lives too, right? Jaden, you're grounded for a week. Or Amber, no computer time or TV time for two weeks. But then God and Earth, not God, Mom and Dad are merciful. And after four or five days, Jaden, you've shown that you've learned your lesson. You've got your privileges restored. Amber, it's been a week and a couple days. We aren't going to go the full amount. We're going to let you off the hook because we, we think you've learned and you've shown that you've learned from your ways. Don't do it again. And that's what David sees in the Lord. He knows the Lord is merciful so that when the Lord sends the pestilence in the morning... 70,000 people already in that day begin to die. And Jehovah, who had sent an angel, you can imagine probably the same type of looking angel that we can think of maybe when Balaam was riding on the donkey in the way with a sword. And there is that angel with a sword over Jerusalem. He's there to destroy the city of Jerusalem. And the Lord says, enough! Stop! The people have been punished enough. They have learned their lesson. And so... The pestilence stops, even before the end of one day. You can see the Lord is gracious and merciful. That's of great comfort to you and me, because if God is that merciful, think of my sins. He will be merciful to me as well in my sins. Now, David does something more. The place where this angel was, was at the threshing place of Aruna, the Jebusite. And David recognizes that, and he says, this is going to be a special place. Let's see what he does with that place. Verse 18. Follow along. And David came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, or not Gad, God, Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. And Aruna looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aruna went out and bowed himself before the king. And on his face upon the ground. And Aruna said, Wherefore is the Lord my king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the people may be, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Aruna said unto David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice, 
and threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these things did Aruna as a king gave unto the king. And Aruna said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. And the king said unto Aruna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. So, on the mountain, remember we're on Mount Zion, that's where Jerusalem is, somewhere here, a little bit off to, uh, we can probably say to the north, is another high place. Okay? And David went to this place on Mount Moriah, and he found a place, a threshing floor, so a flattened area on it, where they could take the wheat and the grain, and they could thresh it, and they could mill it, and do whatever they needed to do. And it belonged to this man, Aruna. And that's where that, that angel had been hovering. God told David to stay the plague, to stop the pestilence. Go there. Set up an altar there and offer a burnt offering to me, a picture of Jesus Christ dying for your sins and being sacrificed on the cross. And there then my justice will be satisfied. So David did that. And when he gets up there, now Aruna sees him coming and he, he bows down. He says, wow. The king is coming to visit me, little old me. It would be kind of like if the president came to visit us. All of a sudden, a, let's just say a, a limousine pulled in. And, it's the president. And what is he doing here today visiting us? And, oh, this is important. Well, no, kids, just stay in your room. You don't want to meet the president today. No, oh, you'd be by the door and you'd want to all get out. And what is he doing and where is he going? You'd already be glued to the windows, right? Aruna felt that here when David came up. He was humbled. And he offers to David when he finds out that David is there to offer sacrifice. Well, here, David, here's some oxen who operate the equipment on my threshing floor. And look, here's the wooden equipment that you're going to need to start the fire. You can, you can break that up. And you might be saying to yourself, now, Runa, why are you doing this? You're, you're giving away your business, your livelihood. But that's because he's so enamored. We might do that too. We might, if the president were to come here, we might not agree with him, but we'd, we'd be enamored. If, if you could get an autograph or a picture with him, I'm, Pretty certain most of you would do that. You'd be, well, this is, this is the president. This is important. What a, he's come to visit us. We've never had this happen before. Mom and Dad, guess who came to school today? Stop by. Look, here's a picture. No, no. No, he really did. Right? You'd have to convince them to believe you. And you would, you would be that same, same way too. And that's how Aruna feels. But David says to Aruna, no, I won't take the threshing floor from thee for free. I won't take your oxen because these things are going to belong to the Lord. I'm not going to take them for free. I'm going to pay you. And so he does. He pays him 50 shekels of silver. He, we read for that. David sets up the altar there, puts the animals on, and then the Lord sends fire from heaven to burn this burnt offering. And that was a beautiful thing. And then that plague was stopped. The Lord orders the angel, Take your sword from above the city of Jerusalem. Put it back into its sheath and stop the plague. This would become the site of the future temple that would be built by Solomon. Okay? So on this place, we have an example of Jesus Christ and eventually the temple, which is a picture of the people's salvation in Christ, will be built there too. So we can see that. We can remember that too, that the Lord, He is a good God. He forgives our sins just as He forgave the sins of David and the people. What a merciful God we can say we have. Even when He does punish us, He is just like our earthly parents, our fathers. And although they realize we need punishment, when we're in the punishment, they also are gracious to us and they forgive us. And they say, you know what? Enough. I think you've learned. You know what you were supposed to learn here. Enough is enough. 